I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Andrew Price. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick an obscure topic and walk you through the ins, outs, and nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is Helen Keller and how she's not real. Who was Helen Keller? Well, she's a person who, due to an illness as a baby, lost her ability to see and hear. And then, as a deaf and blind person, still went on to a life that had amazing accomplishments. She wrote 14 books and became an international symbol for perseverance and the eternal flame that is the human spirit. And then, of course, because that's the way things work nowadays, a bunch of people on the internet are convinced that she wasn't real and now she's basically just an ableist meme. Great. This is going to be one of those episodes. Hi, Mark Sargent. <laughs> Act 1. A moral so potent, it can't possibly be true. The world is a harsh place. It's cruel, unforgiving, unbending, and ill-tempered. It's a place that doesn't give a shit about your hopes, dreams, wants, fears, or aspirations. It's a place that, as people tend to find out, just generally doesn't give two shits about you. And yet, we persevere. We, collectively, the people, humans, from every walk of life, from every corner of the globe, we find ways to overcome obstacles, create memories and legacies, and just simply persevere. The triumph of the human spirit in the face of adversity might as well be our greatest asset. We're always capable of more than we think we are. If time has shown us anything, it's that we have greatness within us all. We have an untapped potential that lurks in the depths of our souls. And that potential can only be harnessed by one person. You, the individual. No one can count you out. You're the arbiter of your own fate. If you have the desire to achieve, to accomplish, and to prosper, no one can stop you. Human will is the only undeniable resource. It's a river of energy coursing through society. It can literally make something out of nothing. It's quite simply the only unstoppable force on planet Earth. Which brings us to the subject of today's episode. Helen Keller is without a doubt one of the most inspiring and impressive people to have ever walked the earth. She's the living embodiment of a Hallmark movie, or a Just Hang In There cat poster crossed with a John Williams score and then rebooted as a cheesy anti-aging drug ad campaign. But you know, as a person. She's so inspiring, it almost feels like it's too good to be true. Should we talk about the fact that this is a conspiracy here? Or should I keep going and we'll talk about it later? Dave, I'm coming into this one spicy as fuck. <laughs> You're harnessing the Gilliam gumbo? The Gilliam's gumbo is a full hundred on the Scoville rating. It'll, this is this is Carolina Reaper. <laughs> I'm coming in spicy. I've got so much shit to say about this. All right. So do you want to have a preamble here or do you want to save that? And I'll set up some basic facts about... Helen Keller, and then you can unleash the bazooka of hot takes. Let's set up this queen. Okay. All right. <laughs> Helen Adams Keller was born June 27th, 1880, and died June 1st, just weeks away from her 88th birthday in 1968. That's a long ass life for anyone. And it's even longer when considered the fact that that she's someone who was deaf and blind in a time when society made no attempts to help her. That's really something to marvel at and and kind of just be sort of mystified by. I mean, obviously, it's all she ever knew, as because as we'll get into, you know, she was basically she was essentially deaf and blind her entire existence. But to live in to live 88 years in just pure darkness, let alone to have risen out of that adversity and accomplish these things is it's just staggering yeah can't even i can't even fathom it she's fucking superman she's like she's it's it's not you will believe a man can fly it's like you will believe that anything is possible because helen keller fucking literally did it 
Over the course of her life, Keller would become an author, disability rights activist, lecturer, and political figurehead. Basically, she was just a complete badass. She overcame extremely difficult circumstances and then used her story to create a better life for people like her and spread that story of human willpower throughout the globe. Born in West Tuscumbia, Alabama, she lost her ability to see and hear as a result of an illness at around 19 months of age. As a child, Keller communicated with what is now termed home signs. They are organically created or spontaneously generated sign languages or gestures, meaning Helen, as a child, invented her own language and means by which to communicate with the world around her. She didn't have any established rubric to learn from, and from the ages of 19 months to 7 years old, she existed in a world free of language and real human connection other than what she herself could generate. This is the craziest shit in here to me. Oh yeah, I've I've been I've been mystified by this since I was a kid. It's just hard to wrap my mind around and it always has been that she has no conception of any of these things. She doesn't know what anything looks like. She doesn't know what anything sounds like. And so the slow process of coming to a common ground of what things mean based on different, you know, touching something and then doing a certain, you know, touch of the face or you know, like it it's it's just I can't even fathom it. Especially concepts that aren't like I'm struggling with how to phrase this, like concepts that aren't corporeal. Like trying to come up with a sign for I'm hungry without ever really seeing food, but you know that you it feels better when you eat and like you know, you're, you're obviously still, she's still a smart woman. So uh, you're, you're processing the world around you, like you said, in a void, but because of your, the way you're developing and you're not seeing anything. Cause like eating is a weird concept. Drinking water is a weird concept and like not seeing other people doing it. And then having someone just like shove bread in your mouth. Like, I don't know that my gut instinct would be to just like chew it and swallow it. You know, like, I guess it is to a certain extent, because like nursing is something that babies do instinctually, but I, and maybe I'm over intellectualizing it, but it's just a, doing it in an absence of example is what is so just impressive to me that this person created a whole language and basically taught themselves, even though they had a family, but like basically just taught themselves how to be a fucking human. Also not having any concept of language. Even when you try to think about it, you're, you're imagining her just kind of in a in a void, unable to see, unable to hear, but like thinking of things in her head, thinking of words and things like that. But like she didn't even know what words sounded like. She didn't know what voices sounded like. She had like or that the concept of words existed. There's no way of ever knowing really what was going on in her head of how, you know, what that what that exchange rate was of like what what the outer stimulus that she received was translated as into her own inner world. Just, there's no way you could ever know. Other than reading her book or many her many books where she talks about even that she's interpreting it into into yeah. language. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. At around seven, she first met Anne Sullivan, who would be her teacher, mentor and lifelong companion. Sullivan taught her language, the ability to read, write, and how to process the world in a sophisticated and complex way. Sullivan accomplished this task by spelling out things into Keller's hand in order to establish a baseline and assist in her developmental growth, which is completely underselling what happened. Yeah, because because it, it, it assumes that she would even have any conception, because the reason why it's hard to fathom this is because we keep taking things for granted. So you're like, oh, she was spelling out letters. So she was like, oh, that's an A. But she didn't know what a fucking A was. They had to figure out what an A was first, and then she could spell the A on her hand. Yeah, and also just, like, establishing a baseline understanding of what things were. And, like, you know, in The Miracle Worker, the movie that was based on Helen Keller's book, My Life, like, there's the very famous scene where uh, Anne and, and Helen are, like, screaming at each other and, like, trying to come to an understanding and she keeps putting her hand in front of the water and and Helen doesn't really understand what's happening and then she finally gets the concept of water it's just so it's so nuts it's so unfathomable and otherworldly that it's almost understandable why there are people on the internet who are extremely ableist and bigoted and don't believe that any of this is true almost 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 but not really because fuck you that sucks yeah I mean, yeah, I have I have a we'll lot, get there. We'll a get lot there. of stuff we'll get to there. say about it. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. Keller would eventually learn the Tadoma method of reading speech from Sullivan as well. 
If you're unfamiliar, Todoma is when a blind and deaf person places their thumb over the lips of a person speaking and their fingers over the cheek, jawline, and throat of the individual in order to basically, in air quotes, read lips, but it's by the shape of their jaw movement and the amount of vibration in their throat that is happening. Isn't that how, like, Vulcans have sex, too? You motherfucker. <laughs> a Vulcan mind meld? I- no. No, you got, I hate you. Am I confused? If I could be using Star Trek with Demolition Man again? Bro, what you're, I guess maybe, maybe you're thinking of, are you thinking of Pon Far, which also has nothing to do with the Vulcan mind meld, but Pon Far is a, every seven years, Vulcans have to return to Vulcan and mate or they go crazy and try to kill people. Yeah. And then there's the shells in the bathroom. <laughs> this, this is making Dave more angry than people not believing Helen Keller is real. See, I control people without being ableist. It's possible. It's possible. Eventually, Keller would learn to speak through this method as well. Despite an exceedingly rocky childhood, which was understandably delayed, Keller attended school, going to both specialist and mainstream forms of education. She even went so far as to attend Radcliffe College of Harvard University and became the first deafblind person to earn a bachelor's degree. She would go on to work for the American Foundation of the Blind from 1924 to 1968, where she would travel the world advocating for individuals with vision loss. And as if that wasn't enough, she was also a prolific writer penning 14 books, hundreds of speeches, essays on everything from Mahatma Gandhi to women's suffrage. She was a member of the Socialist Party of America, the NAACP, and the fucking ACLU, baby! She wasn't just a member of the ACLU, she was a co-founder of the ACLU. Which is important, and I will bring that up again later on because I have a larger point about that. But remember that she was a co-founder of the ACLU. Any one of those things would have been like enough for a normal human being's legacy. When her book, How I Became a Socialist, was burned by Nazi youth, she wrote an open letter to the German student body condemning censorship and prejudice. So now we're going to watch a little clip called Helen Keller Speaks Out. In this room sits a remarkable woman. She's Miss Helen Keller. She does not see the room or the book that she's reading. She sees nothing. She does not hear the rustling of the curtains behind her. She hears nothing. She is deaf, deaf and blind. But if you enter a room, she will know it. Your lightest footfall will tell her you are coming. She will even tell her who you are if she knows you as she knows her old friend, Polly Thompson. Polly has been with Helen Keller 40 years. For nearly half of these, she has been Helen's only companion, Helen's eyes and ears upon the world. She talks with Helen by a finger system in which each letter has a sign, like this. In reaching out beyond her dark and soundless night, Helen depends most on touch. Two other senses remain. There's taste and there's smell. Scent, the scent of objects and places and people, tells Helen much that we learn with eyes and ears. But her hand is her chief link with the outer world, with Polly, with Anne, the part-time helper, with everyone she encounters. With her hand, she reads Anne's lips. She answers with her voice. It is an unnatural voice, and it is her great sorrow. For all our years of effort, Helen has never learned to speak clearly. This isn't strange, for since she was a baby, she has not heard a word spoken, nor seen lips forming one. But let Helen, with Polly's help, tell you. It is not blindness or deafness that burns me in my dust. It is not blindness or deafness that bring me my darkest hours. It is the attitude that I put men in not being able to speak normally. It is the acute disappointment in not being able to speak normally. Longingly, I think how much more good I might have been if I had only acquired my children's speech. Longly I feel how much more good I could have done 
if I had acquired normal speech. But I would have this sorrow for life to learn it. I understand more fully. But out of this sorrowful experience, I understand more oh, fully human strivings, all human strivings, to out and ambitions, thwarted ambitions, and the infinite capacity of home, and the infinite capacity of home. The thing you kind of miss out there without the visual is there's something kind of interesting at whenever Keller is speaking and Anne Sullivan is interpreting what she's saying, they seem to have a system where they're holding hands and, you know, because she has no idea when she's, whenever Anne is is talking, whenever Anne is done interpreting her, what she said or whatever. So they seem to have a system where whenever Anne is done talking, they, they, they're holding hands and they, they, they're holding their hands up. And whenever Anne is done talking, she lowers their hands. So then Helen Keller knows that she's finished speaking. And then whenever uh, she's talking, the hands are down. And then whenever Anne goes to speak again, she lifts the hands back up. So it's just this really simple way of, you know, giving, I guess, sort of social cues of like, you know, I'm I'm speaking and then I'm done speaking. And then now it's your turn to speak. We're going to get more into this later. But, you know, just a mad like watching this video. Another thing you could have missed is the the hand sign language that they're doing whenever Anne Sullivan comes in. She's talking to Helen Keller and they're doing like it almost. I mean, just visually, you can't help but it can't help but sort of look like they're doing like a really elaborate secret handshake. Um, and, to, you know, to sit there and watch them communicate like that and how fast it is. It's not, I mean, obviously she, you know, in this video, she's, she looks to be in her, in her sixties or or seventies. The, the video supposedly is from 1954. So that would mean she'd be 74. And so they've obviously been doing this for a long time. So they're, it's like this lightning fast communication. Um, and I just, you know, like I said, we're going to get into this more, but just imagine the um, the sheer amount of work that was put into developing all these systems and learning all these things only for a bunch of fucking teenagers in the future just sitting in their rooms doing nothing to just doubt your existence. In the years since her death, Helen Keller's autobiography, The Story of My Life, and its many adaptations have graced both the stage and the screen, most notably in the film The Miracle Worker. And to make this incredible story of human triumph all the better, some people on the internet now think it's all bullshit. Today we have something exciting to tell you about, and that's that we now have Mystery Treehouse Investigation Agency membership patches, three and a half inch patches that you can buy and put on jackets or sweater vests or normal vests or cowboy vests or hats that you just started wearing recently, or you could sew a patch onto a patch and then have that patch on a VHS copy of Patch Adams. And then you could cosplay as the character Patch, which is Wolverine's alias when he was in Madripoor running a nightclub. They're pretty cool. You've got an illustration of me and Dave as the Mystery Treehouse Investigation Agency. I've got a a, a magnifying glass. Dave's got a flashlight drawn and colored by Dave. You can go to any of our websites and go to the store. You can go to heydavebaker.com. You can go to dapricerights.com where they're available. Or you can go to deepcutspod.com and go to the official merch store for Deep Cuts. Bacon and legs. Act 2. Fucking really, bro? TikTok currently has over 2 billion downloads. It's the fastest growing social media app, and it's actively shaping youth culture. It's created an entire wave of young celebrities who use the app. It's helped turn the tide of elections, and it's generally just fun to be on. TikTok started its life as, uh, well, another app entirely. Musical.ly was created in Shanghai, China by Alex Zhu and Liu Yu Yang in 2014. It was originally intended as an educational app, but quickly transitioned into a lip-syncing app where users could pair themselves with popular songs. In 2016, it had roughly 70 million downloads. Also in 2016, Douyin was founded, also in China. 
which was a short form video sharing app. The company ByteDance bought Musical.ly and merged it with another video app, a Douyin clone app, and created TikTok, which came to the US in 2017. And it's since taken off, unlike many social media companies, since the arrival of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. These days, the platform is used to make funny and charming videos of people dancing or lip syncing to their favorite movie clips or making explainers or just, I don't know, generally goofing around. But in truly American fashion, we can't have a good thing just be a good thing. Yes, there's the whole fact that the company is Chinese-based and... Well, uh, it's tracking all of our data for who knows what reasons, but, uh, you know, it's it's fine. The, the real letdown here is the legion of kids on TikTok who think Helen Keller isn't real. Currently, videos under the hashtag Helen Keller and hashtag Helen Keller is over party have amassed roughly 17 million views. This is a YouTube clip of some wannabe edgelord comedians trying to be funny. So I will make the case that at absolute best, and this is at absolute best, Helen, K Helen Keller was able to say and comprehend a few words and short phrases. All the advanced speech she gave was trained and rehearsed for her by her trainer and teacher, Ann Sullivan, mm -hmm. almost like a parrot more than a person. Wow. And so... I will say this. She went blind and deaf at 19 months old. Do you know what the prognosis is for children who go blind and deaf at 19 months old in the year 2020 as opposed to the to 125 years ago? It's that they will <laughs> never be able to function in society. They will never be able to communicate. They will not be able to engage in normal behavior. There is no hope. You just have to mitigate it. I looked up a lot of reviews of people who talk about this kind of thing, who work with blind deaf people. Okay, stop it for a second. Pause it for a second. <laughs> I know exactly what you're gonna say. I looked up a lot of yeah. reviews. There's so what much, the f like yeah. there's a Yelp for like for people who need help. Like what the fuck is this? Like I hate this guy. It's it's a growing and growing thing that I I see a lot. Um, and we talked about it on the Chris Hansen episode. Um, when we talked about those people who are shitty on Chris Hansen. Um, which you know, in general, I agree with their criticisms. Obviously, if you haven't listened to the the three part Chris Hansen episode, but there was a part when they were like, you know, he said we weren't real journalists and I've looked up stuff on journalism. So that's bullshit or whatever. And it's just like you've looked up stuff on journalism like that does not make you a journalist. It's that it's this it's this thing. I, I, I see it more and more where people will say that they know what they're talking about and then they're their example of how they know what they're talking about is that they did a Google search. It's that it's, it's that, uh, it's that Andrew Garfield, amazing Spider-Man thing where he's like, I've got to research my father's death. So I'm going to use Bing and search Parker death. Yeah. I mean, Google searching and finding reputable sources for things is a good tool for informing yourself for making you an expert on something that is beyond the scope of your intelligence. It's not going to cut it. Fucking bullshit. All right, keep going. This guy sucks. I'm lashing out violently at you because of confusion. And, you know, it's it's sad. They're, they're totally distanced from reality. And so they obviously lash out. You're way more likely to engage in that kind of behavior from these patients than you are them trying to read. Because they can't read. There's a fundamental level of perception that you need in order to. Well, it's got to stop it again. But the this is this is a this is a straw man argument because. What he's failing to recognize is that, you know, number one, unfortunately, our healthcare system in the United States, as well as in a lot of places in the world, um, is woefully lacking, um, not enough funding, not enough destigmatization of certain conditions, not enough proper care and approach to certain conditions. And you have, you know, you have healthcare providers you know, working not one on one with one specific patient over a series of years, but a healthcare provider, you know, working with a group of, of people or, you know, an, an entire facility of people. You know, my, my, my stepdad is a, is a physical therapist and he, you know, he oversees multiple different facilities because they're so, uh, understaffed in that sector of healthcare and they are so underfunded that you'll have like 
teams of people that have to go and work like three different jobs at all these different healthcare facilities and be managing and overseeing hundreds of patients at different um, at different facilities because of this issue. So you're comparing the apple and orange situations of a like uh, the hypothetically these healthcare workers that are talking about you know dealing with um, you know deaf mute uh, blind patients in a modern setting as opposed to a literal life companion that worked with her from the time of childhood until she died. And it was it was her sole dedicated job. Also, just fuck anybody who says that, like, who says that kind of like ableist. uh, If you're born this way, you can never have a good life and you you can never be a a contribution to to society and you can never uh, fuck that, man. Fuck that shit. Yeah. I mean, of course, uh, do we even need to watch any more of this? He he just says. Yeah, he just says this just for the sake of the audience. We don't have to stop it and go back and forth this guy fucking sucks but just to get and so the audience has an idea of the level of intolerance and assholeness that's on the internet let's just play a little bit more engage with anyone at any meaningful level and that includes both audio and visual you know it, or it, i don't you don't need both because i've never I'm, thought there, of this there are deaf people who can communicate and there are blind people can, who can communicate but that's only because blind people take advantage of audio Deaf people take advantage of visual. That's the only reason that it's able to be done. Is it a coincidence that in all of human history, there have been blind deaf people? Not once, not once in human history, other than Helen Keller, have they been able to engage with someone like this and speak in this way? And also, and you may say to me, oh, there was someone 50, there was someone 50 years prior to Helen Keller that was also a taught blind deaf uh, person. That person is even less credible than Helen Keller. <laughs> but they, they literally are. I, I, got, I went on a deep fucking dive with and so, um, I can't believe you're shitting on that. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. So I'm saying it's simple. It is far more likely that she is a hoax than it is likely that of all blind deaf people throughout human history, she is the only one that was capable of speech. And not only speech, because remember this, this is not purported that she was able to recognize water. It was purported that she was a very uh, political person with a lot of astute observations about the goings on in society. And what you don't know is that Ann Sullivan, her teacher, isn't it remarkable that all of Helen Keller's political beliefs align exactly with those of Ann Sullivan, her teacher? That's weird. It's weird that she finds this one woman, teaches her how to say a couple words. There are literally speeches, political speeches of Helen Keller that you can find where the actual speech is Ann Sullivan standing there talking with Helen Keller's hand moving in her hand. Oh, and you know, it's like, like, uh, it's just all right, like, okay, oh, fuck it. All right, fuck it. I can't <laughs> handle it anymore. I can't handle it anymore. Fuck these guys. These guys fucking suck. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this is kind of not necessarily emblematic of the greater point of this because a lot, like, a lot of what we're talking about is this weird trend on TikTok with young kids. And these are just a bunch of, like, our age fucking dude bros. Um... But uh, but yeah, it's still it's there's a lot of things about this that are really annoying. I mean, number one, like I'm not saying I'm not saying we're professional comedians. We certainly aren't. But like, what the fuck is this podcast? Like, what even is this podcast? Is it supposed to be funny? He's just like he's like reading off all of this like misinformation. And then they're just all like laughing at it. And like, what is what is the point of this? Uh, they fucking suck. I'm not even. We're not even gonna say their names because they're so fucking shitty. But it, it, unfortunately, this video has 388 thousand views on it, which is like Jesus. It, it, this apparently ableism and bigotry sells, which I guess we didn't really even. Of course, it does. Well, this is. I mean, this uh, the second part of this is because you were saying that it's like wannabe edge lords, which is true, but it's a little bit deeper than that. Um. And uh, I'll actually just I'll actually just read this rather than trying to like half assed paraphrase myself because I was just talking about this earlier today for an unrelated reason. Um, But the thing about this is that, you know, as is as we'll get into, as is maybe the case about this entire thing, it started off maybe as like a quote unquote like satirical joke that morphed into a real thing which is how all these conspiracy theories start now like every everything we're dealing with right now was like a thing that like started off as like an ironic edgelord joke 
that like slowly made its way into like out of context situations where people saw it, didn't realize it was supposed to be a joke and were just so dumb that they started believing it. And then it just like became sentient and real. But for Hoven's Toupee, please go listen to our Verhoven's Toupee episode. Yeah. So, so, you know, there, this, this, these guys are talking about this, like this could very well be in and you know, and, and you have like people who espouse hateful or dangerous rhetoric. And then after the fact, when they get criticized, they just say like, Oh, I'm just joking or like, Oh, I'm like, I was just saying, like, I, I was just saying stuff. It doesn't mean anything or whatever. I'm just messing around. Uh, and you know, this could very well be be what they're doing they you know the, or what they're trying to do like they may, maybe this guy doesn't actually believe this maybe he doesn't believe it as strongly as he's acting like he's believing it maybe he's just trying to be funny for going off on a edgy rant about this historical figure that everybody knows about or whatever uh but i was just saying this earlier today so i just want to read this thing that i said um so quote unquote it's just a meme bro is destroying our world Human beings are not meant to say things and have an algorithm distribute that thing to the entire population. We all exaggerate. We all give an opinion, but word it in a way that presents it as fact. We all purposely or unconsciously fudge details or aspects of something to make it a better story or to better fit our narrative. That's not a great thing to do, but when isolated to our immediate circle of influence, it's relatively harmless. It's the reason why conspiracy theorists who believe in the NWO and reptilians and shit were just some fringe group of a couple thousand weirdos who nobody paid attention to for decades, and now it's a genuinely mainstream thing. We were not meant for those things we say to be disseminated out of context to every fucking person on the planet. It hacks our brains and hypnotizes us into believing shit without thinking about the logistics because it emotionally gratifies us. The real danger is the machine is self-perpetuating because every person involved thinks that they are nobody and sharing a meme or a quote or an article with false information does nothing. And nobody realizes that they are all a cog in a bigger mechanism that needs all of those individuals to keep sharing that shit in order to function. So in that way, every single individual is incredibly important. Arguably, every single one of us is more important in the machine of spreading false information on social media than we are in voting for elected officials in the way that the system works. So it's all these people sharing something because they don't think it's a big deal because they're just some nobody and they don't see the significance of a meme and not realize that they are directly contributing to distorting reality. So when you when you look at something like this. If you reach out to these people and you're just like, you're just like spreading misinformation and they, they might very well come back with you and just be like, just chill out. We're just joking, man. It's like a, it's a podcast. Who cares or whatever. And that is the direct attitude that is like destroying our fucking world. I agree. Um, I guess maybe do you want to walk us through some of the tenets of the conspiracy theory and maybe talk a little bit about why some of these points um, may have taken a foothold. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, Dave, I think this broke me. <laughs> I think this fucking broke me. There, we have, in, in a in a year in a in a in a year of some of the craziest shit in terms of like misinformation, conspiracy theories, reality distortions. In a year and longer than that, but like specifically in 2020 is when these things like really took root and became big. But this has been going on for several years now in a year of QAnon and fucking covid denial and flat earthers and fucking Mark Sargent talking to him. This is what broke me. Did, why, what was it about this that separated? Like, I would have thought that literally talking to the guy who, like, started Flat Earth would have been more frustrating than just, like, some annoying teenagers on the internet. There's something about how needlessly destructive, devoid of any purpose it is that's that just destroyed me. You can understand why people believe in QAnon because they feel oppressed and they feel like they're they've gotten a bad lot in life and it's a coping mechanism to blame some dark secret thing that's responsible for the bad luck that you've had in life that it's not just random tragedy or your own personal failings but rather there's like a literal gang of supervillains that are purposely fucking you over You can understand that. You can understand the flat earth thing because of the reasons that they, that Mark Sargent talked about, that it's like making yourself feel more significant. You know, it's a salve for the meaninglessness of existence to think that you actually are important, even if 
that importance is you believing that you're like some fucking Goro from Mortal Kombat science experiment or whatever. I forgot about that Goro thing. <laughs> I completely forgot that his like in his slideshow of talking about how aliens or how we how we live inside of a fucking snow globe space in in, in space how the aliens were just Goro from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> oh, Mark, I hope you stayed listening to our show after you were a guest. And if you are, go fuck yourself, Mark. But this is like in every conceivable way there's no point to it they dredged up this woman who died decades ago and who did nothing but help people it'd be different if she was like no yeah if, if it was like if it was like reassessing the 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 legacy of somebody like oh john lennon was great and blah 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 the beatles are one of the most influential bands of all time and he died tragically and all this stuff but, you know, in reality, he was very homophobic and he was a wife beater. And also all of his like revolutionary stuff was very performative. And he wasn't actually like this leader of fucking progress. He was just a dude who sort of like co-opted that culture to seem cool or whatever. Like that's one thing because that's actually damaging to to culture and to people. It, it's 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 damaging to not reckon with bad or problematic things that people have done all you need is insincerity all you need is insincerity yeah because i mean like you were you are helping you you just prog you you moved us forward culturally three years when you just did that <laughs> i mean it was it wasn't like a huge jump three, yeah, yeah, three yeah. years but three years something. in the span of the cosmos I mean. yeah does it does it work every time? So if I just go, all you need is insincerity. Like, is that another six months, or is it just that one joke moved us forward three three years? No, you, every time you do it, it moves us three years. But then you you get into that situation of like, you know, when you enter a sweepstakes and you're you're allowed to enter as many times as you want, and you're just thinking like, man, if I just sat here all day and entered, like, I could I could really like stack the you know the the deck in my favor, but like. You know, where, where it's just, where, where does it end? How, how far do I have to go down the rabbit hole to do this? All right. I've got a pitch for you. All right. All right. Close your eyes. Right. Someone's listening to this episode about Helen Keller and they open it up and they're like, whoa, nine hours. <laughs> and then, and then eight and, and a half here, hours of it. Eight, and a, <laughs> eight and a half hours of it are just on a loop. Me going, all you need is insincerity. Oop, boop, 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 boop. All you need is insincerity. Oop, boop, 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 boop. I am the walrus. All you need is insincerity for eight and a half hours. I'm telling you, man, the universe needs this. Just the I am the walrus is a year. But that that that's one thing. But literally, like, and and if and if Helen Keller had some dark fucking truth to her or whatever, then that's one thing. But there's there's no purpose to this other than to call into question the ability for a disabled person to accomplish things because it's like intimidating that that you can't like that that you can't, that you somebody somebody who you perceive as like physically inferior to you is like was more successful than you are uh, a good rubric for living your life is if you're punching up you're probably doing something good right like if you're like you know, oh, this elected official is not representing us well, and this is the reason why. Or if this celebrity is corroding our culture, and this is why. Or if this artist is doing something that I disagree with, and this is why. Those are people that are theoretically elevated above you in your everyday workaday life. But if you're punching down to a person who's deaf and blind, like, I'm, I'm sorry, guy, you're the bad guy. If you're like... If you're attacking someone because you're like, no, they're too good at being a deaf and blind person. Mm, you're probably a piece of shit. You done fucked up. You done goofed. You done. All you need is insincerity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. So yeah, I mean this. Yeah. This, wait. Does it does this, it work if wait, does it work if we both say it at the same time? Do we go forward six years, or is it just me saying that stupid joke? No. If we both did it, it would work. So if we got if we could get if we could right now our Peter Pan moment, speak out to the deep cuts listeners, everybody across the globe, those like three people in New Zealand, and like. We're like number seven in the fucking TV and film category for iTunes in fucking Morocco or something like all those people in Morocco who put us up to number seven on your iTunes charts. Everybody simultaneously. Let's all sing together. All you need all is, you it's, need a is a it's a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> this is the dumbest thing we've ever done. This is the dumbest thing we've ever done. <laughs> I'm just picturing the animated <laughs> montage of like the lights in all of the cities going out and like cheesy violin music coming up and people walking out of their homes like what's going what's going on and then there's like a little boy way down at the end of the street and he's like all you need is it's <laughs> already and then, and then slowly all of the people start swaying in time and there's like a chorus of all you need is sincerity <laughs> and then the human spirit from all of them grows over the earth and it takes the form of CGI bargain basement John Lennon with his circle glasses and he winks to camera. <laughs> fade to black and then all the nazis faces just melt off like fucking indiana jones this fucking broke me but essentially what the what the conspiracy theory or weird satire trend that got out of hand is is that helen keller either doesn't exist at all she's not a real person or she was a fake like charlatan who was either only deaf or only blind or neither and was like kayfabing her entire life. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll have more to say about that later, but the, the, the basic tenets of the conspiracy theory are that her, her caregiver and teacher and Sullivan was like her puppeteer. Like, so part of, part of the conspiracy, one of the, one of the flavors of the conspiracy theory is that she was deaf, blind, mute. But that she didn't actually know how to do any of that stuff. She never learned any of that stuff. She couldn't communicate any of that stuff. It was just a fake thing by Ann Sullivan. Ann Sullivan was pretending like she was communicating and she was essentially like using her as like a ventriloquist dummy and and like pretending that she was saying all these things and writing her books for her and writing her speeches for her and all these things. Another part of the the conspiracy theory is or one, one of the aspects of the conspiracy theory or one of the versions of it or whatever, there's so many different versions of it, uh, is that Helen Keller's parents essentially like, like were in denial that she was disabled or, or just didn't want to acknowledge it or whatever. So they just like basically like just started hiring teachers to fix her quote unquote. And they just kept hiring them and firing them until they found like the right sort of patsy or person who would tell them what they wanted. And they found Ann Sullivan and they essentially just chose her because she was telling them what they, what they wanted, that she was teaching her these things. And so the whole thing was just like a fake thing where the parents just like hired a crazy person to tell them what they wanted to hear. And that's essentially what her entire existence was was their her parents like inability to acknowledge that she was disabled like what is ann sullivan's end goal like let's just say this is true which it's not it's ableist trash but let's just say it's true why would someone yeah the, the long game of like assuming that eventually she could turn the child into like a national celebrity because of the amazing feat of teaching her all these things and then she could use that as a platform to like espouse her radical socialist political views i guess that is the thing but that's just that's such a wild stretch that's like such, that's a, such a hat on a hat on a hat on a hat like it, it, like what like you you that's like that's like if uh if instead of running for office alexandria ocasio cortez was like i'm gonna open a cat cafe and have a really cute cat and then I'm going to train the cat to do tricks 
and then train the cat to speak English so that I, the cat can run for public office. Like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Like, no, she would just run for fucking public office. Like, it's so fucking weird. Yeah, to summarize, there's different, like, quadrants of this. There's the one where it's like she literally didn't exist. This is just a fake person that was made up in history books or whatever. The Helen Killers. That's what they that's what they were, uh, like to be called is the Helen Killers. Yeah, that's what that faction is called. And then there's the version where she was deaf, blind, mute, but Anne Sullivan was like using her as a puppet and she didn't actually learn or accomplish any of those things. It was just Anne Sullivan kayfabing. And then there's another which is usually referred to as the Anne Sullivan bitches. Mm-hmm, yeah. And then there's the slightly milder one where people believe that she was either deaf or blind, one or the other. She did learn all those things, but she was like faking one or both of her disabilities. I think that's the one that annoys me the most. Yeah. And there's also, there's another aspect of this, which is like weird. And I don't know when we, I don't know when we want to get to the part of like debunking these things or whatever, but whether it's now or later on. Let's, let's watch some of these videos first and then we'll do that. But what, but one of the, one of the other, like out of nowhere, like just like, like a hat on a hat on a hat, just like a weird frosting, like on this cake of conspiracy, just like the fucking frosting on top of it is also this other thing where people say that she was racist. Yeah. I saw a bunch of videos like that too. And I was like, I don't really get this because she was part of the, NAACP and like hated Nazis and was a socialist. I mean, maybe she was a racist because she was born in 1880. Like I wouldn't be surprised if she was racist, but also she was a part of the NAACP. I have a lot to say about it and I have a lot of quotes and details and things, but as a brief teaser for that, it's just a completely manufactured lie out of nowhere. It's like literally made up. That part of it is just completely made up. I wonder what that's like not having a concept of what race is and then having someone trying to like the like what was it like the first time that she had a conversation around what racism was? I'd be so curious what that would be like. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like I said, there's there's definitely a lot of things to talk about in that regard. But it's it's interesting because there's a lot of things at play there because you know, obviously before she, before Anne started teaching her, she wasn't able to com- communicate very effectively. Um, so you could maybe say that before she started working with Anne, she really had no concept of what was even going on around her at any time. However, um, I have something to read about this a little later, but that's actually somewhat of a myth. She actually had learned to communicate before she ever met Anne. Part of the, part of the conspiracy theory with the whole, she's a, a puppet of Anne is like she never she didn't know how to communicate at all and magically once Anne came into the picture suddenly she started being able to communicate um but that's actually not true she actually did learn communication skills prior to Anne um so she was at least able to understand and interpret the world around her to some degree before she started being taught by Anne so she might have had a concept of race uh in some way uh but also she lived in basically at one point her family owned slaves so she had slaves and they were servants of hers and she was at least i'm assuming aware that they were slaves or servants or whatever um when she was a little kid and then they you know this this her entire meeting with ann and and learning all these things is post civil war. So by the time she met Anne and started working with her, slavery had been abolished at that point. But uh, at some point early on in her life, she did have some concept of slavery. So uh, let's play a little game, uh, and we're gonna watch some some TikTok videos here. And the game is called "Fuck These Idiots Stop." I also ha- I have some other videos that I've added as well. We'll watch yours first because they're sort of like canonical these are like the origins of this or whatever but i've got some videos to watch i have a bigger point to make and so i've collected some videos i'm warning you not just the audience but you dave that some of these videos are horrifically offensive but i think it's important to show them just for the sake of making a larger point 
but they're not they're these are not softballs these are like the worst examples of the shit that's being posted on tiktok about this subject but i'm, I'm just i'm pre-warning you just because i don't want you to be shocked what it is is that i don't know that she was as real as we claim she is and whenever she told me this I was dying for like a 10 minutes straight. And so I decided she should come and tell you guys her theory. So the story of Helen Keller starts, she was born. And then when she was like 18, 19 months old, she got sick. And when she got sick, she lost the ability to hear and see. She had her famous teacher Ann Sullivan come, taught her all kinds of words. And then Helen Keller became this huge, inspiration speaking of peace and justice and love and equality you know you hear that and you're like yeah girl get it and then you're like whoa I'll hold know. up how do you teach someone that is blind and deaf the deep meanings of those types of words like peace and justice and freedom and suffrage and socialism like, I can't even get that. We just want to give a disclaimer. We're not hating on any no. anybody with a disability. We just don't understand what's going on here. I don't get it. She told me she poured water on her hand and she knew it was water. How did she know it wasn't apple juice? And of course, you know, she's all like, oh, water, like writing it in her hand. To her, it's just liquid. Of course, she does have her other senses. She can taste and smell things, so that's how she would know it was an apple juice, I guess. But how do you make the difference? How does she know it's not apple juice falling from the sky when it rains? Oh. How do you know? Oh. like water. How would she know that it's the same water that she's drinking that's falling from the sky? You know what I mean? Like mm. the difference. Differences of water. The rain. Drinking water, well water, bathing, what, what? We don't know. How does she know she doesn't bathe in apple, apple juice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hold up. According to a simple Google search, Helen Kells, who? <laughs> I don't know her. Also knew five languages. Three of the languages were Latin, French, and German. Helen Keller learned to read and write in Braille, and then she learned to speak by feeling vibrations and feeling the lips for shape of the sounds. What? So how do you learn all those languages? That doesn't even like, make sense. In German, such like an angry language, you know? It's mm -hmm. like they make a lot of noises. Mm -hmm. How would she know that? And we probably just sound really ignorant. But we, we don't get it. I just can't even wrap my mind around this. Like I'm just sitting here, I'm like. Is it possible? That she is what she was? Was Anne like some kind of, was it witchcraft? Was it like, is Anne just like this goddess, like teaching people? Okay, I, fuck these idiots, I'm done. <laughs> fuck these idiots, I can't do it. So we're gonna watch more of these and we'll definitely talk about this more. But another point I wanted to make about this, so this this video highlights it because of all the videos, at the very I'm least- I'm so angry right now. <laughs> like, all the I'm, the one, I'm the one who put that video in the script and I'm <laughs> fucking livid right now. At, in this video, of all the videos, at the very least, they're kind of saying like, and this is just that problem I talked about earlier where I was reading my whole thing about, but they're, they're, at the very least, they're kind of saying like, we're just dumb and don't understand this or whatever. Like it's, it, and it's like, I can't even, there, there's, there's a lot to unpack about that of like why you would even make this if, if that was the case, if you were self-aware of that, but it, rem, it just, it just, rem, it, it's, it's a bigger overarching point that all these videos have. And that I think kind of the thesis of this is where these people, it's like, because they don't understand something, they just assume that it's not real. And it's like this, this, this whole phenomenon of like, if you can't, it's, I mean, it's the Dunning Kruger thing that we've talked about before. It's, it's, it's the flat earth thing that we've talked about before. It's like a, a lot of, a lot of what we talked about on that episode of just like, if I don't understand something, it can't possibly be true. And, you know, that, that's just so, it's so baffling that people operate like that. And obviously that's a lot of issues with why our world is the way it is. And there were a lot of the problems that we're experiencing in our modern era. A, you know, a lot of it can be traced out back to like 
people not understanding something and just thinking in their mind that if they don't get it, then it must be fake or it must be a lie or something. It always reminds me of, uh, for me personally, I mean, there's there's tons of things that I don't fully understand because I'm not an expert in them or whatever, but it reminds me a lot of, I always think about this and I always, anytime I'm ever thinking about tunnels underneath cities, subway tunnels or just underground structures and things like that. I always, I'm like, how do they build those? Like, how do they, like, that's so crazy. Like the idea, like we went on this tour of this gold mine in Colorado one time and it was this old, and I was especially thinking about it then because it was like, this isn't even, this was built in like the fucking 1800s. Like this, they didn't have modern technologies to make these kinds of things back then. So it's even more crazy and impressive. Like, how do you build, how do you like build out a, like a fucking structure underground like like what is the process of that what what is what are what are the engineering um concepts behind building out a a room or a whole space under the earth without it caving in like i don't i i don't understand how that would work because i'm not a fucking engineer and it's hard for me to wrap my mind around it and i'm sure there's probably some fucking listeners that are listening to this and being like well you don't fucking know about that um, but no, I don't. I don't know anything about how you would build a fucking underground structure. Well, will, will you you will when there's a boy genius office building and underneath it is a secret subterranean lab. Yes. And the lab is dedicated to learning about how to build underground subterranean labs. It's just one. It's one thing that has always stuck out to me of just like every time I think of, every time I start every time I unfocus my thoughts and start thinking about it. I'm just like, man, how the fuck do they build underground shit? How that's insane. Like they're just putting up like I guess they're putting up like support beams as they slowly inch through it. It's it's crazy. I can't even think about it. But you know what? I don't think you know what you know what thought doesn't cross my mind when I'm thinking about that. I don't think I can't even imagine how they do that. It must not be possible. That's never a thought that goes through my mind is I don't get how this happens. So it must be impossible. But but people do that. People do that all the time. Now we're going to watch some more TikTok. Some TikTok videos. Yeah, this one is doesn't even have any dialogue. It's just it's a it's a silent video of a of a girl sitting in a car and she has her hand over her mouth and there's just text on the screen that says interact with this video if you agree that Helen Keller wasn't real I'm trying to prove a point. And this was this was like one of the early videos that kind of started the whole fucking thing. Um, and there's, there's tons of comments on it that are all, you know, varying degrees of people saying, yeah, she wasn't real. And some people saying, no, she was, you're an idiot and all these things like that. But a lot of people saying she wasn't real. Um, there was another video here that we can't watch now because it's been privated, but it was a, it was a teenage girl who was just like going on on like a full force rant about how it couldn't possibly be true that Helen Keller was real. Uh, and she was presenting all this straw man evidence that she wasn't real. And I wish we could have watched that one because that one was like that was that one was particularly annoying. Um, but they've they've uh, they've oops, that was the script. They've privated these videos or they've taken them down because I'm sure that they've there's been a big backlash to this as it's sort of gone viral and become a trending thing. And a lot of these people are probably like getting harassed or, you know, people are being like, the fuck is wrong with you? And so they're starting to take their videos down, which, you know, it's understandable. It usually happens whenever something like this gets attention where people are just being like ignorant in a vacuum. And then they get people noticing and are just like, the fuck? And then they're like, oh, shit, there's there's like repercussions for things that you say. But I have I have some here uh, to play. Uh, this is just the same one we just watched. Uh, here's one. It's another one that is a silent one that doesn't actually have any dialogue or anything like that. And it's just a, a girl sitting. The weird thing also is like, and I think this is just a general trend. This is just how TikTok works in general is a lot of these videos are like the actual video is just a person like dressed up and like posing. Like the actual video is just this girl dressed up in an outfit that she put together kind of like model posing for the camera like a like a like a video selfie which i think a lot of videos on tiktok are but then they add a just an unrelated message onto it and so this one is this girl who's sitting on a, a bed or a couch or something and she's like dressed in this outfit and she's kind of like she's kind of uh you know mo like mugging to the camera like doing like a duck face type thing pouty lips type thing 
but then the text on it says, uh, why did y'all wait this long to tell me that Helen Keller was actually the daughter of a Confederate war captain and she was really racist and she would memorize the black maid's footsteps so she can pick on them. I'm in pain. But this other thing about how she would memorize the black maid's footsteps to pick on them is just a hundred percent made up. Like there's people just making up fake facts about Helen Keller's racism and just posting them. Here's another one that does have dialogue. And this is another one about her being racist. So I just found out that Helen Keller was racist and I'm just <laughs> baffled. You know how, how did it even go down? She was blind and deaf. Hmm. She says something. <laughs> That's a hand of a color person. She was like, pretending to be blind she had like glasses on and she was pretending to be blind and then she was like holding a person's hand and like rubbing it and sniffing it uh that's what that's the action that she was doing um and then here's another one where it starts out where it's a guy's head in front of a picture of helen keller and it says tiktok is so toxic people are literally denying the fact that helen keller ever existed and discrediting her so that's what it starts out with it's like a fake out video so this plays for a second just playing what's going on you first this so it says this for a second and then it cuts to this and it says psych and then it says there is no way she was real you're telling me she was blind deaf wrote 12 books learned five languages rode a bike fell out of a building and didn't die went to harvard flew a plane and had really good handwriting um try again and it's just some guy it's a it's just a video of his head like a lot of these tiktoks are just like somebody holding a phone up where you can kind of see like the upper corner of their head for some reason. Another one about how she's racist. It's just me when I found out Helen Keller was racist. Um, this is one where it's a girl and it says any mom, when you ask them how Helen Keller managed to say water when she had never heard anyone say it before and had no knowledge of written language. And she's like lip syncing to some random sound where they say next question. Um, okay, so those are the ones that are like specifically like calling into question her her legitimacy or existence. I have a couple here that are an example of so some of these when you when you search the hashtag for Helen Keller or Helen Keller is over party, there's a bunch of them that are like saying she doesn't exist, but there's a lot of them that are just horribly offensive jokes about Helen Keller that have just popped up as a trend of like, there's just a trend now where it's like joke around about deaf and blind people. So I have, a, I have a couple of these and these aren't even the worst ones. The worst ones I don't even want to play, but here's a couple examples of just really offensive jokes that people have made on TikTok. So it's like so this girl and she's like talking to herself playing two characters and she's playing Helen Keller and she says, Hey, Helen. And then Helen says, what? And then she like stops and realizes that she talked and heard her or whatever. And then it's just like an awkward silence between the two of them, which is literally like the same joke that everybody makes over and over again. There's like a million TikToks where a person is playing Helen Keller and then somebody else and the person says something and then the Helen Keller says, what? And then they, their eyes get wide and then they just sit there in awkward silence. Like that's just like, there's a million TikToks that make that exact same joke. This one is really bad. It says Helen Keller trying Pop Rocks candy for the first time. I can't, I don't even know what to say about that. Um, this is another one where it's just that same fucking joke, just in a different form. This is Helen Keller sitting on her porch. It's a girl sitting there staring forward. And then her gardener says, hey. And then she says, hey. And then they their eyes go wide and they both sit there in silence because she just realized she blew her cover. I'm not even going to play this one. It's too bad. This was this one is actually not offensive and has nothing to do with the conspiracy. I just thought it was a refreshing palate cleanser after all of that and i wanted to play it can we talk about the fact that helen keller and frank martin luther king picasso and elvis presley were all alive together in some chunk of period of time like they were all alive i 
thought Picasso was old as shit. I thought he was a 1600s. No, he died in 1973. My parents were already 10 years old at that point. It's a nice palate cleanser. I didn't even, I didn't even play. I, I got, I, I, I lost my nerve to play the last one because it was, it was terrible. I, I am so, I, this is wearing me down. <laughs> this is really wearing me down. In this medium article that was kind of like the epicenter of this whole trend, um, somebody wrote this this medium article about this, but it's not looking down its nose at it. It's like coming from the perspective of a young person saying people believe this, people think that she's not real, and I and I kind of agree with them. And it's this it's just this medium article called the generation that doesn't believe Helen Keller existed. And at one point she says that the reason why people don't believe she existed is because she wasn't taught in school, which is just not true at all. They teach you about Helen Keller in school. I mean, maybe maybe they've changed that. Maybe they don't anymore. But they it's not like some weird thing that you learn in the fucking it's not like the you learn on the streets about Helen Keller. It's like, oh, yeah. You're, you know, you're, you know, you entered the real world when you learn about Helen Keller. Like, it's the thing you learn about in history class. I mean, I'm the wrong fucking person to ask for that. I'm from Arizona. We don't even really believe in school there. They just have like a room with air conditioning that they put kids in for like eight years. And then they let them out and they're like, what did you learn? And the kids are like, I don't know. You're so uneducated that you made the same joke on the last episode. Did I really? Yes. Fuck. <laughs> Wait, which which episode did I make it on? On the um on the the hobby horsing episode, you were doing a like a Swedish accent for Bjork, and I was like, she's Swedish, and then you were like, I don't know, I'm a I don't fucking know about countries. Like I'm from Arizona, they don't have schools there. Fuck, I don't remember this at all. I mean, that's a combination of my just lack of short term memory, and then also, have I ever told you the fact that like the place I'm from, Arizona, we like. You don't really have schools there. <laughs> like it's it's kind of <laughs> fucked up. Like we we don't even really like you know they just kind of put people inside of a building and they're just like ah eh, just read some books and then you're reading a book and you're like Robert E Lee loved Virginia so much that he fought for the South. It had nothing to do with slavery. I'm like that's kind of you know like we don't really have schools in Arizona. Dave, you're gonna make the you're gonna make that one guy think that the episode is skipping. Wait, which what what guy was this? Was he somebody that I know that like what I went to school with? Because you know we don't even really have schools in Arizona. <laughs> God damn it! But so not that not that saying things makes you not racist, obviously, and clearly being a white person living in fucking antebellum South and like low key having slaves at some point early in your life, obviously her her life must have been intermixed with racism in some way um but by all accounts it seems like that stuff she was she completely became a progressive person in her you know as she started learning with Anne and as she you know grew up and became an adult um so not to say that this proves that she wasn't racist because of things she said but considering the fact that the only information about her is about her activism and anti-racist stance and there's literally no information about anything regarding racism at all that you can find. It just it just personifies how ridiculous this is that this this lie has come into existence for some bizarre reason. Um, it's almost it's almost like the QAnon thing where it's like if I don't agree with this person, they're a pedophile. It's like a weird like it's like a weird like uh you know moral high, like self induced moral high ground where it's like. This deaf and blind person wrote more books than I'll ever write in my lifetime. Well, yeah, but they were also racist. Like, it's just it's just like a weird like. No, Andrew, it's this deaf and blind person wrote more books than I will ever read. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, But here's here's some. But I mean, don't come to me about it because I don't <laughs> really read it. that many books because I don't really did. I, we don't really have school in Arizona. It's not really my thing. Like, I don't know. It's not my fault, man. She co-founded the ACLU, I said that, in 1920. Uh, she was an early supporter of the NAACP, an opponent of lynchings, which fucking apparently at a certain point that was like a controversial fucking statement. Uh, here's a couple of quotes from her. In a letter to the NAACP endorsing their work and decrying the social climate of the United States at the time, she says, nay, let me say it. This great republic of ours is a mockery when citizens in any section are denied the rights which the Constitution guarantees them, when they are openly evicted, terrorized, and lynched by prejudiced mobs, 
and their persecutors and murderers are allowed to walk abroad unpunished. In another, another letter in 1946, she said, uh, the continued lynchings and other crimes against the inward, not the, not the hard inward, but the other inward that I still don't want to say, but was more normalized to say at this time, whether in New England or the South, an unspeakable political opponents of white supremacy, according to all recorded history, augur ill for America's future. In a letter to Miss Oster in 1951 regarding the efforts of the W.C. Handy Foundation for the Blind, she says, personally, I do not believe in a national agency devoted only to African-American blind because in spirit and principle, I am against all segregation and the blind already have difficult enough without being cramped and harassed by social barriers. Like I said, saying things doesn't make you not racist, but the just the disparity between these being the only pieces of evidence of her stance on race and these other things having no shred of evidence is just, it's just bears repeating. Another thing is, um, let's see. Okay. Yeah. So the whole thing. So one of the other things that people say that makes it unbelievable that Helen Keller was real was the fact that she flew a plane. Um, but, uh, that's, that's, that's a myth borderline on just a major misunderstanding of a thing that's taken out of context. So what really happened was she, uh, as sort of part of a weird publicity stunt or whatever you would call it, she was taken up in an airplane with a pilot and she was put in the passenger seat. So according to the article, uh, let's see, she she piloted the four engine airplane for 20 minutes as it flew over the Mediterranean Ocean. She sat in the co-pilot seat with the pilot beside her and an interpreter, uh, uh, oh, and an, in, uh, an interpreter relayed her instruct her his instructions so for just 20 minutes while they were free flying over the ocean, the pilot took them up into the air and was piloting the plane, but then temporarily handed over the controls to Keller and an interpreter told her what to do. The pilot was like, all right, move the stick up this way. And then the interpreter told Keller and she did it. And they did that for like 20 minutes. And then he gave, and then she gave the controls back to him, but it's been taken out of context as like she claims she flew a plane, but that's not exact. It's not at all what it was. Um, the other thing about I kind of alluded to this earlier, but the other thing about how they say that the whole conspiracy theory about how Ann Sullivan was just puppeteering her and like it was all fake and she wasn't actually able to communicate and it was just Ann Sullivan pretending like she could. Um, it's a it's a myth because she actually had communication skills before she met Ann Sullivan. Um, it's commonly thought that Keller had no way of communication with her family until her teacher arrived around her seventh birthday. Um, however, Keller, who had no cognitive impairments, was able to use about 60 different signs to make herself understood before she ever met Ann Sullivan. The final thing, uh, which I feel I feel like we just kind of have to acknowledge so as not to be you know, accused of leaving things out conveniently. There is absolutely no evidence of any kind of racism, uh, overt racism. That's not the inborn racism that we all carry with us in a, you know, a systemically racist society, but like a, like the, the racism that's being purported by these TikToks where it's like, she hated black people. She fucking picked on the black servants or whatever. Like there's just no shred of evidence of anything like that. It's, it's wholly invented. However, it does bear mentioning that at least during a certain time in her life, in one letter, she was a proponent of eugenics. <laughs> Whoa, just a little, just a little, little left turn there. But what does that mean? Because she was like anti-Nazi and she also. It like has no, it's nothing to do with race, though. It's it's absolutely nothing to do with race. It's all about people with disabilities. Um, She was ableist. That's not true. Kind of. So basically what it was, so what it was, it was literally one letter. And uh, according to her biographers, she moved away from this belief later in life and only held it earlier, early on in her life. But what happened was, and she on, this is only acknowledged in one letter. It's not like a thing that she spoke about constantly. It, she, she acknowledged it in one single letter. But basically what happened was in 1915, there was a high profile event that happened where a doctor in Chicago, uh, a family, the Bollinger family, gave birth to a baby boy who 
was born paralyzed on its on his left side, uh, missing his left ear entirely, missing the right eardrum. His right cheek was connected to his shoulder, and he had a curved spine and closure of the intestinal tract. So the doctor who delivered the boy was a was a proponent of eugenics, a huge believer in it. And so he decided that he thought that the baby should be allowed to die and that it was better for the better for humanity to not allow people with these kind of disabilities to exist. Um, He said uh, he examined baby Bollinger and arrived at the conclusion that even if surgery was successful, the child would grow up and be a mental and moral defective, quote unquote, who would burden his family and society and taint the human race. Um, indeed, uh, Hazelden, who is this doctor, believed that it would be morally wrong to allow the baby to live. As he later recounted, he, he wondered, would his mind be clear? Would his soul be normally alive? That I do not know, but the choice, the chances are against it. Hazelden informed the baby's parents that in his estimation, the child would be better off dead. In due course, Mr. and Mrs. Bollinger came to agree. So, they allowed the baby to die. It took five days where they basically just left it to die on its own um, by just not tending to it or whatever. And it was a big national scandal and he was heavily criticized for it. And he actually used it as an opportunity to preach about eugenics. He went on like a tour using it as an example and espousing his eugenics beliefs. And it was specifically about disabled people. It wasn't a race thing. Um, so uh, Helen Keller actually had formed a friendship early in her life with Alexander Graham Bell, uh, fucking our 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 boy, the uh, the composer of the or no Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the phone. I was thinking of Francis Scott Key. Alexander Graham Bell uh, was a huge eugenics believer, and it's believed that he must have filled her head with ideas about these things early in her life. Um, and preached this concept to her um, because uh, Helen Keller wrote a letter defending the doctor for his decision. And uh, you can see it right here. Hopefully I have it open. I I don't think I closed. Maybe I closed it. Um, This is a transcript, but there's a, there's a scan of the actual handwritten letter. So it's definitely, it's definitely real. Um, But this is a transcript of it. So in the letter that Helen Keller wrote, she it was an op-ed, I guess, that she published in the New Republic in 1915, December 18th, 1915. And in this letter, she says, uh, must much of the discussion aroused by Dr. Hazelden when he permitted the Bollinger baby to die centers around a belief in the sacredness of life. If many of those that object to the physician's course would take the trouble to analyze their idea of life, I think they would find that it means just to breathe. Surely they must admit that such an existence is not worthwhile. It is the possibilities of happiness, intelligence, and power that give life its sanctity, and they are absent in the case of a poor, misshapen, paralyzed, unthinking creature. I think there are many more clear cases of such hopeless death in life than the critics of Dr. Hazelden realize. The toleration of such anomalies tends to lessen the sacredness in which normal life is held. There is one objection, however, to this weeding of the human garden that shows a sincere love of true life. It is the fear that we cannot trust any mortal with so responsible and delicate a task. Yet have not mortals for long ages been entrusted with the decision of questions just as momentous and far-reaching, with kinship, with the education of the race, with feeding, clothing, sheltering, and employing their fellow men. In the jury of the criminal court, we have an institution that is called upon to make just such a decision as Dr. Hazelton made, to decide whether a man is fit to associate with his fellows, whether he is fit to live. It seems to me the simplest, wisest thing to do would be to submit cases like that of the malformed idiot baby to a jury of expert physicians. An ordinary jury decides matters of life and death on the evidence of untrained and often prejudiced observers. Their own verdict is not based on a knowledge of criminology, and they are often swayed by obscure prejudices or the eloquence of a prosecutor. Even if the accused before them is guilty, there is often no way of knowing that he would commit new crimes." that he would not become a useful and productive member of society. A mental defective, on the other hand, is almost sure to be a potential criminal. The evidence before a jury of physicians considering the case of an idiot would be exact and scientific. 
Their findings would be free from the prejudice and inaccuracy of untrained observation. They would act only in cases of true idiocy, where there would be no hope of mental development. It is true the physician's court might be liable to abuse like other courts. The powerful of the earth might use it to decide cases to suit themselves. But if the evidence were presented openly and the decisions made public before the death of the child, there would be little danger of mistakes or abuses. Anyone interested in the case who did not believe the child ought to die might be permitted to provide it for its care and maintenance. It would be humanly impossible to give absolute guarantee for every baby worth saving, but a similar condition prevails throughout our lives. Conservatives ask too much perfection of these new methods and institutions, although they know how far the old ones have fallen short of what they were expected to accomplish. We can only wait and hope for better results as the average of human intelligence, trustworthiness, and justice arises. Meanwhile, we must decide between a fine humanity like Dr. Hazelton and a cowardly sentimentalism. So in this one letter, in this one situation in 1915, Helen Keller seemed to pretty definitively come forward as a proponent of euthanizing um, physically disabled children using some kind of tribunal of expert physicians that would basically vote on whether the kid should be killed or not. That's fucking rich coming from Helen Keller. Yeah. But uh, but I I I I mean, how old was she in 1915? Uh, she was born in 1880, so she's like 35. Yeah, not not to make excuses for her, and that's pretty old. So I guess that's really not an excuse anyway. Um, but uh, by all accounts, she moved away from this belief later on, and no longer was a proponent of this. But it is worth mentioning. How uh, how fucked up would it be though if the only thing that gets taken away from people by this episode is that Helen Keller believed in eugenics it and just now becomes we, this we start trend. A, new, a, a bigger trend now of all these people being like she was a fucking eugenicist and we're like no god damn it that's not what we were trying to do Ugh. but you know that's uh, people's legacies it's important to be honest about them and sort of cover the totality of them and you know it's 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 neither it's it's neither it's not good to leave something like that out. And it's also ne- not necessarily completely damning this person, um, especially considering that she rehabilitated and didn't believe these things later on. Yeah. Illustrating the shades of gray that make up a complex and well-rounded person, especially one as exemplary and mm-hmm. quite frankly, astonishing as Helen Keller. Yeah. So I, I guess, I guess I had a, a, a larger point to make about that. There's this b- sort of belief that is talked about, um, and this is not this is not meant to be some kind of like old man rant um, whenever I say this. But, uh, you know, in looking through, I mean, I don't know how deep you dived into watching these, but I watched tons of these. I was just I was searching. There's there's literally in these ha- in these hashtags. There's hundreds upon hundreds of like maybe thousands of these videos, um, you know, that I, you know, I, I just stopped going after a while. I don't know how deep down the rabbit hole went. Um, and obviously, this is not representative of the majority of people. This is like a specific thing that's like a trend on this app. Um, but uh, I, I guess I just had this thought about like there's this idea, uh, and we even talked about it on the on the Sandlerton episode, where where uh, if you remember when Matt was sort of like talking about how um, Gen Z kids were like better at using the internet and they were more healthy about it and all these things. Um, and I guess there's this overarching, there's this overarching, uh, belief or concept that's put forth by a lot of people that like Gen Z kids are like fucking the best. Like they, like they've, they've perfected humanity. Like boomers are trash. Gen Xers are trash. Millennials are trash. We're all canceled, but like Gen Z is the, they're the shit. They figured it all out. They've perfected the human condition. They're the baby Yodas of people. Yeah. Um, and, and I even, I even pull this quote. So this, uh, strategic management consulting company called McKinsey and Company did a study as part of a case study, uh, uh, investigation or whatever. Um, as part of their uh, management consultant for marketing to demographics or whatever. And the study is called True Gen, Generation Z and its Implications for Companies. And just one little quote from this um, is, our study based on the surveys reveals four core Gen Z behaviors, all anchored in one element. This generation's search for truth, 
Gen, Gen Zers value individual expression and avoid labels. They mobilize themselves for a variety of causes. They believe profoundly in the efficacy of dialogue to solve conflicts and improve the world. Finally, they make decisions and relate to the institutions in a highly an analytical and pragmatic way. That is why for us, Gen Z is true gin. In contrast, the previous generation, the millennials, sometimes called the me generation, which is not true. The 1970s uh, was called the me generation. Uh, got its start in an era of economic prosperity and focus focuses on the self. Its members are more idealistic, more confrontational, and less willing to accept diverse points of view, uh, which is not necessarily untrue. Uh, and 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 what I say is not to say that uh, millennials are better than Gen Z by any stretch of the imagination, but I guess my point is like I always see these things about like some demographic is like this or like just these dogmatic statements about how entire demographics of people are one specific binary way. And I think it's just bullshit. I think that I think there's like terrible and good people across any demographic and there's no like certainly there's differences and maybe it's getting progressively better in small, you know, inches forward. Maybe maybe ultimately as a whole Gen Z kids are, you know, X percentage more progressive than millennials. I'm sure that's true. But this idea that they're all just like fucking it's a generation of people who just like search for truth and find it. Um, it was even used as an as an example of why people believe in this conspiracy theory. There's an article about this where they talk about the fact that the reason why people that reason why Gen Z kids specifically don't believe in Helen Keller is because they search for truth. Which makes no sense and it's bullshit because all these things are easily debunked by just basic research. Like if you do like these people that believe these things, they all got their information from other TikToks, like all these things about her being racist or whatever. They literally don't exist. This information doesn't exist. There's nothing even remotely similar to this information. There, there's, there's nothing you can find that even remotely in like, like you could be like, oh yeah, I guess I could see how they misinterpreted it this way or whatever. There's nothing like this that exists. Like these were just lies that were made up by s satire, quote unquote, trolls and put in TikToks. And then other people just took them at face value. Gen Z people are not immune to buying into, into misinformation, practicing confirmation bias and being tricked by fucking brain hacking algorithms into believing lies. Um, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a fucking disease that infects all of humanity, regardless of what your cultural upbringing is. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, there's, uh, you know, there's an over, over romanticization of what's happening right now with Gen Z, because I think a lot of people are so, disgruntled is the wrong word i think depressed about the way everything has gone that there's like a fuck these kids gotta figure it out because we've just been fucking up um so yeah i, I think it's understandable why there's that but um and i think that there are probably societal trends that manifest within that age bracket that are about you know wanting to move in a progressive direction because they've literally come of age watching a totalitarian regime try and tear down all of the norms within our country um but like you said i think it's pretty hard to i think it's pretty hard to uh say that any age range of people is just going to have it all figured out like yes am i glad that in air quotes the greatest generation fought back the nazis very much so but also that same generation was responsible for a lot of really fucked up shit. So, you know. Yeah. And, and really my, my, my message or the thing that I want to get across is really not even about the age or the generational gaps, um, or any specific demographic. Uh, really, really all I want people to think about is you're not immune to being tricked by misinformation and lies and allowing yourself to be lured into uh, a, a misinformation trap by uh, by social media, but it also makes people who are so sure and self assured that they can't fall for that more vulnerable to falling for it in more subtle ways 
that can be just as dangerous. And I, I really want people to think about the fact that you are not immune to the human condition of people generally wanting to believe things that they're told at face value and also favoring things that emotionally gratify them and fulfill a preconceived narrative that they already wanted to believe and allowing yourself to believe and fall for misinformation specifically because you think you can't. Ultimately, the internet brings us together and pulls us apart. It's a human invention, so of course it's going to have our flaws and biases built into it. In closing, Helen Keller was real. She's an American hero, a wellspring of inspiration, and deserves better than these assholes are treating her online right now. Fingers crossed that we can get our shit together, but we probably won't. I, for one, am looking forward to working in an office in the year 2028 that has a weird Helen Keller demotivational poster on the wall, I guess, or something. I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Andrew Price. This has been Deep Cuts. You can find me online at heydavebaker.com, where you can find stuff like um, my comics, Action Hospital, Fuck Off Squad, Vicky the Wonderful, all kinds of cool stuff. You can also pick up uh, these brand spanking new, <laughs> brand spanking new Mystery Treehouse Investigation Agency Shoulder Patches, baby! People, people out there in deep cut land, still workshopping that. We've got patches. We've got Mystery Treehouse Investigation Agency insignia patches. You can be a part of the fucking Mystery Treehouse Investigation Agency. You want to battle four armed bounty hunters alongside Hillsmer? Then get yourself, go, go to, go to, go to havedavebaker.com or deepcutspod.com and pick yourself up a fucking mystery treehouse investigation agency patch. Andrew, where can people find you on the internet? And where can people find maybe these deep cuts patches that's connected with you? You can find me auto hoaxing, uh, the fact that fucking George Washington Carver was actually a fucking professional wrestler on TikTok. <laughs> he he uh he 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 spent time in the deep south circuit as the Carver and he had like a giant a giant sickle and that was his thing. I'm going to I'm going to start that and it's going to become a real thing and people are going to believe it. Um and you can also find me at dapricerights.com where you can get my book Deadbolt AI Private Eye. It's about a robot detective solving crimes in a future dystopian society um, that is not unlike maybe more of a present time. Uh, but also you can find the Mystery Treehouse Investigation Agency patches on my website as well, which is just you can you can go to any any of our websites. You can go to heydavebaker.com. You can go to deepgutspod.com. You can go to dapricerights.com. You can get the same patch. The money goes to the same place, but there's three options. You can vote. You can vote with your dollars on who you prefer. Do you like date? <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I'm really setting myself up for failure here because I know how people are going to vote, but you can, <laughs> if you like Dave better, buy them from his website. If you like me better, buy them from my website. And if you like us both equally, buy them from deepcutspod.com. But also, Andrew, don't think about it that people are liking me better or you better because that's a false corollary because it's just I just know more people. I just know a lot of people. It's not like it's that it has nothing to do with if I'm more or less likable than you. I just just physically just know a bunch of nerds. Then why does my wife put a Dave mask on me at night? <laughs> Yeah, and l last thing, uh, as to play us out, one of the listeners, Christopher Levy, he's been he's been a listener for a while. He's been he's been active in our Facebook group, which if you if you haven't already, you should join our Facebook group where we hang out with listeners and talk about episodes and other random stuff. Sometimes listeners inspire episodes. Sometimes we just talk about unrelated stuff that's cool. It's a cool community. Come join it. It's the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Uh, but uh, one of the listeners, Christopher Levy, uh, he's been in there for a while. He has a band called Just Dandy, and uh, he's doing a thing where every day he is covering a chorus from a song and featuring a comic book recommendation on his on the Just Dandy Instagram page, which is um, Instagram backslash Just Dandy official backslash. So every day he's he's covering a, a new song, a, co a chorus from a song. And he's done a couple of the songs from the Napster episode. 
Uh, so we'll we'll play those right now. Uh, but you should check out uh, just at Just Andy Official, where he's doing this every day until their new album Big Chorus comes out, and uh, they're pretty cool. I mean, obviously, I'm a little biased. I I uh, I'm I'm loving I'm loving the fact that he's covering these songs that started out as just goofy things I hummed into my phone. It's very surreal to me. But he's got some other cool ones on here. Also, just to make it crystal clear. If you cover any of the songs from the Napster episode, the Halloween episode, the Christmas episode, or any of the other episodes in the future that will undoubtedly have songs in them, we will fucking put that shit on the show. So if you want to get on the show, just make a really bad cover of, you know, we spend our time out of the sun. We write a code in C++ and uh, you'll be on the show. Do it, Eric Clapton. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. Who listen? Who I know listens to this? It can't get much better. Nobody knows as much about me as my favorite song. And if you wanna hear it, you gotta buy the whole desk and then it'll always be alright. This is the way that life will always. It'll always be tonight. My change. Man. You can never forget them cherries on your berries and bush. Don't you ever forget them cherries on your berries and bush. And if you ever forget them cherries, the mush will taste really ordinary. The flavor experience will be contrary on your berries and mush. Never forget them cherries on your berries and mush. Don't you ever forget them cherries on your berries and mush. And if you ever forget them cherries, the mush will taste really ordinary. The flavor experience will be contrary on your berries and mush. San Mateo, please wash over me. Not day, I love you either way. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. The incidental music for this episode was created by D. Catalano, whose music can be found at wekeepoddhours.bandcamp.com and Dad Beats. You can listen to his podcast, Food Fight, a food discussion podcast, Anywhere you get your podcasts and the Dead Boy Detectives.